I'm Neil Kay and this is the fifth in a series of short videos looking at puzzles surrounding the QWERTY keyboard. We saw in the first video that the first commercially successful typewriters were designed to prevent the type bars that printed characters on the page from doing this. If type bars next to each other on the type basket were typed in quick succession, they could clash and jam the machine. The first typewriters largely solved the problem and in this video we'll see how and why later developments brought back jamming and whether it was a price worth paying. In the earlier videos, we saw how the first typewriters had the type bars that did the printing arranged in a circle. Christopher Latham Scholes, the inventor, arranged the type bars to minimise jamming and aimed at making sure that letter pairs that could appear on the written page did not sit together on the type basket. Here we use blanks to represent the type bars for numbers and punctuation on our Scrabble type basket. We can see how most of the vowels are isolated from contact with other letters on the top half of the type basket. But some letter pairs had to sit together on the type basket, and Scholes made sure as far as possible that these letter pairs did not appear together on the written page. The result was engineered to minimise the jamming problem. The type basket was linked to the keyboard by a system of levers that produced the familiar QWERTY keyboard we are all used to today. If you look at your own keyboard, you'll see that the middle letter row almost follows an alphabetic progression. D, F, G, H, J, K, L, just as in this 19th century Remington. That's because Scholes started off with an alphabetic arrangement before fiddling about with it to reduce jamming. To begin with, the M was also part of this sequence following L. It was soon dropped down to the bottom row to give more balance. The two letters that are missing from this sequence are the vowels E and I. These were shunted up to the top letter row of the keyboard. This also placed them at the top of the type basket, where they were flanked by numbers, making sure they were separated from contact with any other letters. And then the 20th century produced a revolution in typewriter design. You wouldn't think so from just looking at the keyboard. This is an early 20th century Underwood keyboard, and it looks very much like its Remington predecessor. Users had become used to the QWERTY keyboard and tinkering with that would have meant the typists having to unlearn and then relearn a whole new set of skills. That is if they bothered buying the machines in the first place. So QWERTY stayed. Here are the Remington and Underwood typewriters together, the older Remington on the left, the newer Underwood on the right. As we've seen, the keyboards are very similar. Where they differ is in the type baskets. The circular Remington type basket has been replaced and the type bars now sit in a bowl-shaped arc. There were good reasons for this. In the original Scholes design, the type bars swung up from their circular cradle to hit the paper to be typed from underneath in upstrike fashion. The problem was, the typists couldn't see what was being typed until they pulled the paper out and checked it, effectively typing blind. This Underwood was designed with the new front strike system. It very quickly took over from the old upstrike design. Its great advantage was visibility. The typists could now see what they were typing and check if there were any mistakes on the page or jams on the type basket. But there was a price to pay. This is a close-up of the Underwood type basket with all the type bars arrayed from left to right. And here's a Scrabble representation of the Underwood type basket. The problem is that Scholl's careful design of the type basket has been completely unpicked in this design. Where before it would be difficult to find neighbouring type bars on the type basket that were likely to be typed together in quick succession, now there are several. You don't have to be a fan of Scrabble, crosswords or countdown to find numerous words that neighbouring letters on the type basket could help form. The circled letters are just some examples of regions which could produce lots of possible sources of jamming, from WS, SW on the left to OL, LO on the right. The price of visible typing was the reintroduction of jamming as a serious problem and one that was to endure for most of the 20th century. So did Scholes make a mistake in not sorting out the visibility problem at the same time he was dealing with the jamming problem? I think it would be unfair to blame him for that. It was 1870. He was inventing a new technology and he only had basic tools, machines and materials to work with. It was almost certainly easier to arrange the type bars in a large circular type basket compared to the compact, neat array of type bars that were to appear in later designs like the Underwood. On the way, 
Scholes solved many technical problems in addition to jamming. If it hadn't been for him, it could have been many years more before typing was made a commercial proposition and he deserves his recognition and place in history for his achievement.